Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello, I'm Wilma. I'm a recovering addict, and this is Inside Addiction. Well, tell me how it was growing up. Growing up for me, um, I'm one, sec the second of five children, second oldest of five children, and I grew up in Barbados. Um, at two and a half years old, I was sent to my aunt's, my, which was my mother's aunt's, um, because my mother couldn't take care of me, so I was sent to my mother, mother's aunt, and um, my aunt took care of me, sent me to school. I remember my first day of going to um, kindergarten. Um, my aunt was a seamstress, so she always like really dressed me up very well. Um, at that point, I really didn't know any of my siblings. Um, I knew of them, but I really didn't know them. Um, my mother, after that, didn't really come around too much, so I was kind of integrated into that family. My aunt never had her own kids, but she had adopted two other um, young men from the neighborhood. Um, back then, you can just bring kids into the home, and it was okay. You didn't have to go through any kind of legalities to do that. So um, I was like the only girl in the household, and... My aunt really took care of me and her husband. Um, they really took care of me. Um, and that went on for many years and they sent me to school, to good schools. I went to private schools. Um, uh, <clears throat> she was like, like really on a health kick, so I ate very well, exercised, you know, and she was very like, very special kind of woman. And, and um, she took great, great pe pleasure in what she did for me um, as a little girl. Um, I remember when I acted out, she would always say, I'm going to call your mother for you. I'm going to call your mother. And I kind of enjoyed where I was at. I mean, I got everything that I, I, I wanted and I needed. So I kind of enjoyed it. So that was always like, a, like a, some kind of... A, a, a sign for me to behave. And as I got older, um, she was also very strict. I, I, you know, she was very strict, um, very picky about the company that I kept. Um, so I didn't get to like play a lot with like the kids in the neighborhood. Um, she thought that maybe they weren't good enough for me, I guess. Um, so she, she kind of like mostly wanted me to play with the kids that um, friends of hers that had kids or, you know, family members, I would play with them more so. But I remember um, having to be in the house real early and, 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 and watching, having to be at the window watch, watching the kids outside play. And that went on for a long time. And then I decided one day that I want to go outside and I wanted to play jump rope, hot scotch, you know, and things. And they were having so much fun. And back then, it was no one cursing. You couldn't curse because back then, the village raised the kids. So, you know, if you got a beaten out there, you get beaten and come, come home because you weren't supposed to be disrespectful. And so, you know, that one day, I, I remember going outside to play, and I stayed out a little longer than my curfew because I had a curfew. And I got a beating for that. Um, but I had so much fun, I did it again. And that's where I think my defiance took off. Um, and I would see, you know, in, in, in the whole time span of that, I would see, she would take me to see um, my siblings. And at that point, my grandmother had had my, my other siblings um, because my mother really, like I said, wasn't able to, um, take care 
of, um, of, of her, the five children that she had. And um, I would go over and I would see them and spend some time with them, but I never like spent, like stayed overnight or anything like that. I always go back home. But again, hanging out became part of me wanting to go outside and play and actually being defiant in playing outside it was just, I got addicted to playing outside earlier on. And um, I think after a while, I didn't care about the repercussion that came with it. Um, and that went on for a while. And I remember my uncle, he was like the only one in the household that drank. And he would go out um, every evening and go out and have a drink with the boys. I remember him doing that and would come home. But there was no... Um, violence or anything like that in the house that he came back came back very quiet very calm and so that didn't really affect anything that i can remember but i also remember us my aunt making there was a, a homemade remedy of we call it rice wine he would take all these uh, um, a concoction and mix it together and let it sit and then when the holidays rolled around you would have wine when company the company the company came around and I would always get a little sip like on Easter, Christmas, you know, certain occasions. And I remember that and I remember feeling really woozy from that. I remember that very well. Um and that went on. But by the time I reached about fifteen, like like my rebellion really, really progressed to a point where I was not going to school anymore. Um, I want to hang out more than I wanted to go to school, and I just like stopped going to school. So tell me about the first time you used alcohol or drugs. I think having that rice wine and that effect was the first time, and that was way before I even thought about just like just running, running wild. Um, the effect from that that was like my first use that I can remember. Um, but after I had left home, 15, then I started, I went to my grandmother, my grandmother's house, and I started really using them because I was out of school, I had quit school, uh, and I really started using with some people that lived in my grandmother's neighborhood. And um, so that became part of the everyday thing for me, and I adapted pretty quickly. Um, at six, 17, um, I had my first pregnancy, um, and I drank during that whole pregnancy, and I remember one day being very intoxicated, um, and falling and hitting my back, and that baby died. I was like seven months pregnant, and the baby died. And that was like my first tragic experience with um, alcohol. Um, but it didn't stop there. Once I, you know, went to the hospital, um, got better and came out and drank again. Um, this is unknowing to having a problem. Didn't know he had a problem back then. Alcoholism wasn't discussed. Um, and I'm going back, wow, 40 years, you know, um, that wasn't discussed. And I just kept drinking, just kept drinking, just, just kept drinking. Um, marijuana came into play later on. And it, it, it kind of went hand in hand. And back then, it was very, very accessible. Marijuana, um, there was nothing wrong with that either, you know. And, I had my fair share of marijuana, Barbados. Um, by then, my mom had came to the United States, and soon after, I, my grandmother asked my mother to please see what she can do to get me to come and join her because there was nothing else that she can do. By that time, I, I was involved in every criminal activity you could think of, you know. I just was running wild in Barbados.
question <clears throat> of your use and in, in running wild and in what ultimately started out with the rice. The right, the progression came while I was still in Barbados. I remember like almost every night coming home in a blackout where they have to actually bring me, knock on my grandmother's door and just throw me in the living room. Like I drank till I was out. Um, and that went on for some time. And I think that's what prompted my, my grandmother after many talk talkings, you know, um, many talkings and I would turn around and do it all over again. And I think that's what prompted my grandmother to ask my mom to please hurry up and get me out of Barbados. And when I came to the United States, um, I just kept on doing what I was doing. Um, I was introduced to harder drugs here and I fell right in place. I didn't miss a beat. Um, and I kept using and I kept using. Um, <clears throat> I done stole, manipulated, lied, lost many jobs. Um, I always try to work because I, I need to say that prior to all of that, my aunt had instilled very, very um, um, strong morals um, in me as, as far as being self-supporting, self-sufficient, respectful. So I had those, those core moral uh, values. However, once I started when I got here and I, and, I, and I continued using, I lost a lot of them. A lot of them were misplaced, I should say. And um, I kept on using and I, I met, you know, some people that weren't the nicest people in the world. And I then became some of those people. Um, and I went through the whole welfare system, you know, and um, I got pregnant right after coming here, arriving in this country, had my daughter, um, didn't stop using. Um, Eleven years later, I had my son, didn't stop using. So using has always been a part of my story. And I lived, like they say, I lived to use and I used to live um, for many, many years. And sad to say, I never said it, saw anything wrong with it, sad to say. Um, so, tell me about some of the consequences of that, that continued use after having the two children and you mentioned losing some jobs and what are some of the consequences? Consequences became, <clears throat> I became homeless, I became jobless, um, utter desperation, um, doing some horrible things um, to get money, to, to, to um, get drugs, um, lying, you know, um, getting arrested. Um, so I, I had my share of um, 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 consequences. I was fortunate never, have, never having to do any time um, per se, but I have enough um, bouts with police of police officers. You know, um, at one point I was facing some serious charges, and um, I was able to. I know that was God. I, I didn't know that until after that the the person that was involved and kind of like took the weight and kind of like cushioned my fall of going to prison because it was a real serious crime. So that was, it was an eye opener, but I still wasn't able to connect the dots. You know, it, 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 it put some fear, it, you know, it, it did plant some fear in me, but soon after that, once I was able to um, use again that quickly, like, went away. You know, it was just something that I kind of, like, glorified after a while. I was able to glorify that, you know, and, like, yeah, you know, so. 
very ignorant, very ignorant. Um, but <clears throat> throughout all of that, you know, um, I knew I could do better. Um, I knew there was a better way because I was able, I would see people every day doing better, having money, maintaining homes. Um, I just wasn't able to do it. And, you know, I became, I became comfortable with the way I was living because I didn't think, you know, that good life was for me anymore. So, it was just a horrible way to live. It was just horrible. It was just, I was very desperate, you know. Um, but I just didn't know how to, like, pull myself out of that, that, that hopelessness and that helplessness. I remember I was homeless and I finally, finally got an apartment um, and I was living in, 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 in one of those apartments um, in Yonkers, New York, and it was, um, they called it the West Hab Apartments. And I remember it was a young lady that lived in the building um, that she was a single mother and she always told me that she remind, I reminded her of um, her mom, um, and apparently her mom had died from active addiction. And, and she obviously remembered me, uh, you remind me of your mom. And she, we became very close, and she was mi much younger than me, and we became very close. And um, we would always talk, and um, she, she lived there for a long time, and I would babysit for her sometimes when I was in the right state of mind to do so. Um, and one day she told me that she was leaving, um, and, and she said she was going to move to Albany. Um, I asked her, why Albany? She said, I just want to get out of, from Yonkers. I just want to get away from here. And she had prepared herself for school, made the connection up here to go to school and everything. And finally, she did make that move. By then, I had moved into a, my own apartment, and my progression my, my, my addiction was still controlling me, um, and I moved into this apartment, and it was a very nice apartment. And my son was with me, and my daughter was um, living somewhere else. Um, and I just couldn't stop using. I tried school, I tried work, I tried going back to school, going back to work. I worked for the County of Westchester for many years, and I lost my job as a result of my using. And I tried going back, they wanted me back, but I just could not do it. I just could not stay stopped long enough to show up for work daily. Um, at that point, I wasn't paying the rent in the apartment and um, that time came. It was time to leave the apartment. Um, and in utter desperation, I, I happened to call, because I had nowhere else, I had burnt bridges. I had nowhere else, and I called this young lady that had moved to Albany, because I had a brilliant idea that I was going to leave or leave here, leave everything behind, go to Albany, start all over. Nobody knows me, and I had asked my son's grandmother, can she, he hold on to her, her? But I became desperate because it was time to leave the apartment. So that was one of the things that made me, yes, I'm going to do, you know, all the right things, and I came to. <clears throat> I came to Albany. Um, she helped me. She said, I'm going to sign up for school because um, I'm going to sign up for school. So my whole quest was to come up to Albany, go to school, get a good job, start this. And I would never drink, if I, you know, and all that stuff. I'm not going to do the things that I do here, not understanding addiction at all. And I left Yonkers in October of 1995, and I came up to Albany, I stayed with my girl, the, the, the young lady um, from, from Yonkers, and I stayed there for a while. And um, I was on unemployment, on, on unemployment at that time. So when I came to Albany, I had no real money. So I was pretty much um, um, living off of my girlfriend until my, my unemployment got transferred. 
And I did well up here for two weeks in Albany. Two weeks, no drugs, no alcohol. And boy, I thought I had arrived. And um, not knowing that it's not that easy. Um, not knowing that money was a trigger. These are things that I learned after. But once I got my first unemployment check, I remember cashing the check and I wound up in the liquor store. And when I say wind up in the liquor store, literally not planning to go to the liquor store, but wound up in the liquor store. And I remember buying a small nip bottle of Cardi, and I remember drinking that. And after drinking that Bacardi, I remember walking the streets of Albany trying to cop. And I copped. And I remember them, what I thought then was overcharging me for the drugs. Um, and I was able to use some of my skills and kind of like talk them down a little bit, but it wasn't like what I was used to spending back home. Um, however, it took off and I, I had spent all of that and all my money and I remember having to tell my girlfriend and wasn't able to stay there anymore. So I moved to Troy, to the Women's Y in Troy. And I took me to the Women's Y in Troy, not understanding. Um, never lived in a community environment such as that one. So I, I, I you know, they had rules and regulations there and um, I defied each one of them. And I used, and I came, and I went as I pleased, and I used, and I came, and I went as I pleased. And I guess the tenants there got really upset and started complaining. And at that point, there was an <clears throat> intervention done by the director of the Y. And I remember her, this was in December. I, yeah, this was in December 29th. I remember her knocking on the room door um, of my room, knocking, knocking on the door and asked to speak to me. And I went downstairs and I spoke to her and she didn't ask me, but she told me um, that I needed to get some help if I wanted to stay there. Um, and I remember being real speechless. Um, I wasn't able to defend Anything that she was saying, I remember being really speechless because all I could have thought of that time that if I get thrown out of here, I have nowhere to go. And that's when I guess it all began for me. Um, she sent me to um, a recovering uh, um, a place which right, was located right across the street from the Y. And... She sent me over there, and that's when I, they asked me all these questions. Um, because I need to say I never sought help with my using, never sought help, never saw anything wrong. People around me went to get help, but I didn't. Um, so she sent me over there, and that's when it all began. Um, they gave me an appointment to come back. And I went back, and that's when I sat in this room with all these people in the circle, and it took off from there. So taking off from there, <clears throat> what's been the hardest part of recovery? I think the hardest part of recovery for me was in the beginning not understanding what recovery was all about. That was the hardest part for me. The hardest part was not being able, not understanding what it was all about, not understanding the concept, not understanding. Uh, um, I was told that I had a disease, not able to understand that with disease. Um, and I just kept showing up. I just kept showing up. Very baffled, but this was in treatment. My recovery process did not begin yet. I was in treatment. Um, so get, having to understand what this thing was all about and be educated about addiction 
Um, I got that. I was introduced to that in treatment. Um, back then, I should say, um, it was in, it was imperative to go to meetings. Um, that was part of the process treatment, and that's when I was introduced to um, um, the recovery process and people that had similar stories. Because this was all like a big blur for me when I first came around, you know, not knowing why, you know, you use, had to go back and look at abandonment issues, had to go back and look at rejection from mom and dad, you know, dad never being in the picture was never in the picture. So I was able to connect the dots at, 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 at you know, as an adult, you know, had, was able to connect the, 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 the dots then and, and, and understand what this journey of mine was like, you know, growing up. What would be your message to someone watching that's still sick and suffering? Um, the message that I, was, I'm try, I would try to put out there today is that, you know, uh, um, the recovery process, like I'm grateful for everything that I experienced from birth up until this point. Um, I think had I not experienced what I experienced, I wouldn't be here today, first and foremost. Um, this is not, you know, I, I, I hear some people say, recovery people say that, you know, the low self-esteem and how society might view you and, you know, um, <clears throat> that this, this is the best thing that can happen. Um, it's about giving yourself a break. There was no mistake. I don't believe that there was a mistake in the path that, that I, I experienced. Um, and I think that if you are um, experiencing active addiction um, and you feel like you want to do something different, I think you should give yourself a break. And I think that you should like um, um, take direction from others that has been in this process, um, that's still in the process, and that's telling you that, you know what, you don't have to live this way, because you really don't. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.